right, so let's get started. Let's invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of the faithful, and kindle within us the fire of thy love. O Father, please send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your consolation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we now move to the next major event of Christ's life and his public ministry, the temptations of Jesus in the desert or the wilderness. And once again, <laughs> we're going to pull out a few themes here. I think three major themes. First of all, Jesus' Davidic kingship. What is it here in this mystery of Christ's life that reveals, once again, his messianic Davidic kingship? Secondly, we're going to see Jesus as the new Adam recapitulating, that is summing up in himself and his own life story, making right what Adam wronged in the garden. And then thirdly, we'll see Jesus as the new Israel. Jesus actually sums up in this event of his life the very story of Israel in the wilderness and actually succeeds in areas where Israel fails, makes right what Israel wronged as the people of God. So let's look at Jesus' Davidic kingship. The first clue is the fact that Jesus actually goes and does battle with the devil. We read in Matthew chapter uh, 4 that the Spirit of the Lord sent Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus was sent into the wilderness, into the desert, to endure and to experience the very conflict with the devil, to do battle with him. Well, why is that significant for Jesus' Davidic kingship? Well, according to the Old Testament, throughout salvation history, all of the new kings of Israel would go and do battle against the enemies of God's people. King Saul, for example, when he is anointed, he goes out and fights the Philistines. When King David is anointed, we already saw this, he goes out and fights Goliath. Hezekiah was a a well-known king of the southern kingdom of Judah, a righteous king, and he's known for keeping at bay the Assyrian army. When the Assyrian Empire ransacked the northern kingdom in 722 BC, later that Assyrian army, a few years later, would actually attempt to ransack the southern kingdom and destroy the southern kingdom. But King Hezekiah held them at bay due to his fidelity to the Lord. And so he saved the southern kingdom. Now later in 587 BC, the southern kingdom would be wiped out by the Babylonians, but King Hezekiah is known, known for doing battle with the enemies of God's people. And finally, King Josiah, a great righteous king in the history of Israel, actually does battle, is known for doing battle with the Egyptians, goes out to fight the Egyptians, and he actually dies in the plains of Megiddo. Right? You remember that? Mount Megiddo, Ormageddon. We talked about this in the Revelation Seminar. King Josiah dies fighting the Egyptians in the plains of Megiddo. Okay? So that's where the Ormageddon comes from. So Jesus is like a new King Josiah when John talks about the battle of Ormageddon in the book of Revelation. Okay? All right, so the point is, is that all throughout salvation history, the new kings of Israel go and do battle against the enemies of God's people. What is Jesus doing here in the wilderness? Keep in mind, right after he's visibly anointed as king by the Holy Spirit, what does he go do? He does what every good king does. They go fight the enemy of God's people. And that prime enemy is Satan himself. There's also the prophecies of the messianic king's victory over the enemies that looms in the background of Jesus doing battle with the devil. One in particular is Psalm 2, verses 1 through 9. Here are a few excerpts. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his Messiah. The Hebrew there is Messiah, which means anointed, right? The Greek version would be Christos or Christ. Verse 5. Then he will speak of them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. 
So a part of the messianic hope and the prophetical tradition of Israel, the messianic king, the Messiah, the anointed one of the Lord, would come and defeat the enemies of God's people, bring about victory. So that's sort of in the background there, against which Jesus comes and does battle with the devil after being anointed as king. He is the messianic king. He is the one of, with a rod of iron that will dash hit the enemies into pieces, and that primary enemy being the devil. John himself would actually identify Jesus as this messianic king in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Recall how the woman gives birth to the male child, and John tells us that that male child, whom we know to be Jesus, rules with a rod of iron, which is a quote from Psalm 2.9. So the Christian tradition sees Jesus as this messianic king of Psalm 2. So the application to Jesus is that Jesus is the Messiah king who's fighting the greatest enemy, the devil himself. Now someone might ask, well, why not Rome? If Jesus is this messianic king, why doesn't he go after the Roman Empire? Because they are the foreign nation, the enemy of Israel, that's oppressing Israel within their own land. So they're in a sense in exile within their own land. So why doesn't Jesus come riding in on a white horse and whack off the heads of the Romans? Well, because the Romans are the least of his worries. They are not the primary enemy. The root of the Israelites' foreign oppression is sin, folks. Is the influence of the devil. That's the root cause of Israel's problems in the first century. That's the root of the problem. So Jesus, as the messianic king, comes not to defeat Rome, but to go to the root of the problem by taking on sin itself, by taking on the devil himself. You see? Here's a quote uh, from my former professor in my graduate studies, Dr. Edward Sri, S-R-I, in his book, The Mystery of the Kingdom, I think that's, no, yes, his book, The Mystery of the King, which is a brief commentary on the book of Matthew. He writes the following. Here Jesus is simply acting, here Jesus is simply acting in accordance with what the Jewish law and prophets said about Israel's situation in the first century. Israel's suffering under foreign occupation was actually a symptom of a much deeper illness. Unfaithfulness to God brought on the exile and the fall of the Davidic monarchy in salvation history in the old, right? To focus on driving out the Romans would be to miss the point. Violent revolution would not solve the problem. Why? Because the problem's not Rome. The problem is sin, unfaithfulness to God. He continuing to quote, Thus Jesus came not to fight the Romans, but to treat the root of the problem, the sin of Israel and the sin of all humanity. If sin were conquered, Israel truly would be set free. This explains why Jesus set out into the desert to lock heads with the personification of all evil and all sin, right? The devil himself. So you see how he's drawing out the reason why Jesus, as the messianic king, goes to the devil and not Rome. Because the devil is the true enemy and as Jesus, the true king, he must go and fight the true enemy. Does that make sense? Amen? Okay. Second clue for Jesus' Davidic kingship. He goes out into the wilderness to do battle. Now, some translations say he went out into the desert. Well, according to biblical scholars, the Greek word there for desert can be translated as wilderness as well. So the fact that Jesus goes into the wilderness to go fight the very enemy take care of the problem that's prohibiting Israel from faithfulness to the divine bridegroom Yahweh, right? What does Jesus go and do? He takes care of that obstacle. Well, the fact that he's in the wilderness calls to mind the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which we already referenced, as well as other verses. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God comes with might. What happens in the wilderness? God brings salvation. God takes care of the enemy of God's people. 
And his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. So Isaiah 40 prophesies about God coming to bring victory over the enemy of God's people in the wilderness. And what will he do? Feed the flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs in his arms. Right? Now, Ezekiel says in chapter 37 verse 24... My servant David shall be king over them and they shall have one shepherd. So Isaiah talks about God shepherding, bringing, fighting the enemies of God's people in the wilderness and then shepherding his people. But Ezekiel identifies the son of David as being that one shepherd. That is, God will shepherd his people through the son of David, you see? So you, when you bring these two prophecies together and you read it, as the backdrop for Jesus going out into the wilderness to fight the enemy of God's people and take care of that enemy, what is being revealed here? Jesus is this son of David who will shepherd, right? Who will be that one shepherd who feeds the flock of God's people. Amen? Okay. Clue number three for Jesus' Davidic kingship. He is among the wild beasts. Mark chapter 1 verse 13 tells us this. Matthew leaves it out, but Mark highlights this detail, this little detail. Why, Mark, why tell us that Jesus is among the wild beasts? Well, what does this imply? If Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's among the wild beasts, why would Mark tell us this? What is the implication? Well, first of all, it implies that the wild beasts are not attacking him, right? He's not getting eaten up by the wild beasts. Y'all see that so far? Amen? Say amen. Let me make sure you're all awake. Okay. Now, why is that important? To tell us that the wild beasts are not eating Jesus up in the wilderness and not attacking him, not harming him. Well, once again, when read in light of the Old Testament, we find the answer. In Isaiah chapter 11, which is the prophecy about the branch shooting forth from the stump of Jesse, it is a prophecy about the messianic king but in the presence of the Messianic King, you have the taming of the wild animals. Let's read Isaiah. Chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And what shall rest upon him? The Spirit of the Lord. Verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and a little child shall lead them. That's sort of the uh, root scripture passage that I've chosen for the divine child Institute, A little child shall lead them. Verse 8, The sucking child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. End quote. So within the context of Isaiah's prophecy about the son of Jesse, or son of David particularly, right? A descendant of Jesse, this messianic king, Isaiah talks about the wild beast being tamed in the presence of this messianic king, this child. And so we come to Jesus in the wilderness, and he's among the wild beasts. The wild beasts are tamed in his presence. We see a possible implication, a hint, that Jesus here is indeed that branch from the stump of Jesse in Isaiah 11. Jesus is that child, that messianic child, in whose presence the wild beasts are tamed. So that one little detail right there, the wild beasts, he's among the wild beasts, suggests to us possibly the revelation here in the temptations in the wilderness that Jesus is indeed the messianic king, the branch from the shoot, the branch shooting forth from the stump of Jesse. Okay? All right, so there's Jesus' Davidic kingship. Summary, clue number one, he does battle with the devil, which all kings do. They go and battle the enemies of God's people. Clue number two, he goes into the wilderness. Clue number three, he's among the wild beasts. Do you see? Now we move to our next theme here in the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus is the new Adam. And we can take the catechism of the Catholic Church as sort of our springboard as we launch into reflecting upon the fact that Jesus is the new Adam as well as the new Israel. Paragraph 538 of the catechism states the following. Jesus rebuffs these attacks. Now this is in reference 
to the temptations that Satan proposes to Jesus and Jesus' response to those temptations. Jesus rebuffs these attacks which recapitulate. Stop there. What does that mean? It's a theological term that means to recap. Right? To summarize. To sum up. So recapitulation in theology means to sum up things of the old. Jesus sums up within himself and his own life story, the very story of Israel, the very story of Adam, to fulfill, right? To bring order where disorder was insinuated, to make right what was wrong. So, getting back to the text, Jesus rebuffs these attacks which recapitulate the temptations of Adam in paradise and of Israel in the desert. The catechism gives us a sort of outline there upon which, uh, by which, we can actually reflect upon these temptations. So we know that Jesus is fulfilling or recapitulating temptations given to Adam in paradise, and then the temptations of Israel in the wilderness. So we're going to go through this, and we're going to look at the, tem- the three temptations of Jesus in the desert and see how they parallel the three, temptations of, three major temptations of Adam in, the, in paradise. And then ask the question, what's the significance? And then we're going to look at the three temptations of Jesus in the, in the wilderness and see how they parallel three major temptations of Israel in the wilderness and while they're journeying for the 40 years, right? Wandering for the 40 years. All right, so let's do it. But before we look at the connection with Adam, we need to establish a little groundwork here. And that is St. John's commentary or teaching about what our Catholic tradition calls the threefold lust or the threefold concupiscence. St. John writes in 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In our Catholic tradition, these three things that St. John identifies as that being a part of the world are called the threefold lusts or the threefold concupiscence. And what this refers to is that there are three major areas of the human condition, of our human experience, where we experience disorders, right, as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve, and where Satan appeals to and pushes those buttons, so to speak, right? Three major areas of the human condition where Satan appeals to to tempt us to get us to sin because we experience disorder within these areas of the human nature. So here we go, the lust of the flesh. This refers to the disordered desire for sensory pleasures. Things that pertain to the body, things that pertain to the senses, it primarily refers to the bodily appetites, right? The desire for food, the desire for drink, and the desire for sex. But of course, we don't struggle with those desires, right? I mean, nobody in our American culture struggles with the desire for food. Nobody struggles with the desire for drink. And I guarantee you, nobody struggles with the desire for sex, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, we all struggle with, the des- with these desires. We struggle ordering. Now, are the desires for food, drink, and sex bad? No. They're a part of our human nature. God made us with, the des- with these desires. If you didn't have a desire for sex, the human species wouldn't propagate, right? And wouldn't continue. If you didn't have a desire for food, you wouldn't sustain your natural life and drink as well. So these desires are good. But as a result of the fall, we experience disorder within these desires. We, have, we struggle with trying to order the desire for food. So we eat too much sometimes or we don't eat enough, right? We struggle with the desire for drink and very often we overindulge in drink. We struggle with the desire for sex and very often we overindulge in it or partake of it contrary to reasonable ways, you see? See? And so because we, sh- we have this disorder, this is one of the areas where Satan appeals to in order to lead us to sin. Okay? Now, there's also the lust of the eyes that St. John talks about. What is this? Well, the catechism states it's a disordered desire to possess, i.e. covetousness, for earthly goods. 
There's nothing wrong with desiring to possess earthly goods, but as a result of the fall, we experience disorder within this desire. So very often, we have a disordered desire for earthly goods, and we, we attempt to attain those earthly goods in ways that are contrary to reason, right? Okay, so, and of course, America doesn't struggle with that either, right? <laughs> I mean, just go to Fred Meyer, man, right? Go to Costco. All you see is what? Stuff! right? Earthly goods, our shopping centers or our new temples basically, right? I mean, what's the, what's the biggest place in all communities? Walmart or some sort of grocery store, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with grocery stores, and, but the point is, is that we struggle with this desire for earthly goods, okay? And then finally, the pride of life refers to uh, a disordered self-assertion. As humans, we or embedded with a desire to assert ourselves, even in a, as God created us. That is, to take control, to lead, right? To make things happen. God created us with a rightful desire to do that. But what happens as a result of the fall, very often we struggle with ordering that desire. So what happens, we're tempted in that area to assert ourselves over and above God and over and above neighbor. And so it becomes disoriented, right? So these are the three major areas. Bodily appetites, a desire for earthly goods, desire for self-assertion. These are three areas of the human condition where Satan appeals to constantly to lead us to sin. And what we find is that it is these three areas that Satan appeals to with Jesus in the wilderness and with Adam in paradise. So let's look at them. We start with Jesus' temptation. The appeal to the flesh. The appeal to the bodily appetite or the desire for food. Matthew 4, 2 through 3, remember? Matthew tells us, after he was hungry, Satan comes and says what? Change these stones into bread. So Satan appeals to the flesh of Jesus. That is, his bodily appetite for food. And he appeals to that to try to get Jesus into sin. Well, what does this parallel with Adam in the garden? It parallels Adam in the garden because Satan actually tempted Adam by appealing to the flesh as well. Genesis 3, 6 tells us it was good for food. That is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was good for food. So there was a desire uh, to satisfy the appetite for food. And that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for that food. So Satan appeals to the flesh of Adam as well, you see? So what's the recapitulation significance? What's the economic significance here? Christ the king fights the battle of the human race and succeeds where the human race fails. And that is in sensory pleasures. So Jesus shows us that he has the power to rightfully order the desire for sensory pleasures. The desire for food, the desire for drink, the desire for sex. So Jesus is the answer to all of our disorders within this area of the flesh. And he can actually help us order it accordingly, okay? Now, uh, a theological insight here. Just think about this for food for thought, meditation. Notice how Satan tempts with the good. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for food. And Satan tempts Adam to go contrary to the Father's will with something that's good. Why? Because Satan's not going to come and tempt him with something that's totally evil. Why? Because Satan's not, I mean, excuse me, Adam's not going to do it, right? He's going to say, no, get away, right? But he lures him in with something that's good and gets Adam to choose the good over and above the best. What is the best? Obedience to the Father's will. How might Satan do that in your life? How might Satan do that in my life? Well, I know for me, speaking from personal experience, it's a darn good thing to study theology, right? And I can do it for 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And so how does Satan tempt me with that? Well, he tempts me to choose that good sometimes over and above the best. And at times, what is the best? What is the Father's will? Spend time with my children, right? Spend time with my wife. 
For you ladies, it might be shopping, right? I don't know. Chris says, yeah. <laughs> That's nothing wrong with shopping. That's a good thing. But sometimes Satan might tempt us to choose that good over and above the best, which is spending time with husband. Or it might be going to church on Sunday, right? Going to mass, whatever it may be. For guys, it might be sports. So think about that in your life. Meditate upon that. What is something in my life that may be good in and of itself, but I actually might be choosing over and above and before the best. And so think about that and try to figure that out. Okay, now, the next temptation of Jesus, uh, one of the temptations of Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. Satan tapes, takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down on their hands, they will bear you up. This is an appeal to self-assertion. Okay? T Satan is tempting Jesus to assert himself and to assert himself in a way that contradicts the father's plan because Jesus would assert himself eventually by teaching uh, and proclaiming himself to be the Messiah later on in his ministry but Satan tries to get Jesus to assert himself contrary to the father's plan because if Jesus were to throw himself off of the pinnacle of the temple the top of the temple well what's present there among the temple Jews right and so if Jesus throws himself off and he often comes down in some dramatic fashion right well he will be asserting himself as the Messiah and everybody will say yeah hey, he's the king he's the Messiah woo let's make him you know and so Satan's tempting Jesus with that self assertion well lo and behold we also find it in the garden Satan tempts Adam to assert himself over and above and before God. Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 5, we read, For God knows that when, uh, Satan is speaking here, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The tree was to be, uh, then the author comments, The tree was to be desired to make one wise. Satan tempts Adam to make himself wise, to assert himself in the knowledge of good and evil over and above God. To be like God, not with and in and through God, but divorced from God, apart from God, right? Remember, God made Adam in his image and likeness. Adam and Eve were already like God. They had the divine life in their soul. But Satan tries to get them to be like God apart from God. To be absolutely like God. To know good and evil absolutely. That is without limits. That is to say, they determine what is good and evil. Not subjecting to God's declaration of what is good and evil. And there, my dear friends, lies the root of moral relativism. Relativism in and of itself, right? It's all the way back in the garden. It's Satan's lie. I determine what is true and what is wrong. What might be true for me might not be true for you. But I determine what is right and wrong, what is true and what is erroneous. You see? So, Satan tempts Jesus, uh, excuse me, Satan tempts Adam to assert himself over and above God. So the recapitulation significance is that Christ the King fights the battle of the human race and prevails where the human race failed, and that is in self-assertion. So Jesus has the power to rightfully order the human desire to assert self, but to assert ourself in and through and with God, in accordance with God's plan, to take control of situations, right? But in accordance with the Father's will, to be assertive in our life. Get things done, so to speak, right? Especially in the spiritual life, amen? That's where, self has, that's where assertion, being assertive, can come to fruition. But it has to be done in and in accord with God. Uh, a couple of theological insights here. Notice Satan tempts Jesus to manifest his glory outside of God's time. You know, Jesus was the Messiah. He would be identified as the Messiah. But Satan's trying to get him to assert that Messiahship apart from God's timing, apart from God's plan, ultimately apart from the cross, right? So what in our life are we trying to grasp at? What are we trying to assert in our life that might not be God's timing yet? It might be ours, rightfully so. God might have promised it, might, have, might give it to us, but it might not be God's time yet. So you can take that for your own spiritual meditation. And then uh, also, too, notice Jesus, Adam, and Eve are tempted to take what is rightfully theirs, once again, but apart from God's plan. Adam and Eve were already like God, but they're tempted to be like God apart from God. They already knew good and evil, right? 
What's the good? Don't eat. What's evil? If you eat, <laughs> you will die. They already knew that. But Satan tries to get them to possess that knowledge apart from God in an absolute way. So it's basically idolatry there. Worshipping of self. And then we come back to Jesus in the, in the desert. Matthew chapter 4 verse 9. All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Satan shows them all the kingdoms of the world. Right? He says I will give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. Notice what Satan is appealing to here. He's appealing to the desire for earthly goods, right? Earthly riches. Well, Satan does the same thing to Adam, and that's implicit in the following statement of Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It was a delight to the eyes, right? Why does St. John call it uh, this, this desire for earthly goods the lust of the eyes? Because we come to desire things when we see it. When we see it with the eyes, then we desire to possess it. And so in the garden, we see that the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil was a delight to the eyes. That is, they saw and they wanted to possess for themselves. So we see an implicit hint here to Satan appealing to the desire to possess earthly goods. So the application to Christ is that Christ the King once again fights the battle where the, for the human race, prevails where the human race failed, and that is possession of earthly goods. So Jesus has the power to give us, to help us, rightfully order our desire for material things, right? Whether it be clothes, whether it be toys, right? Uh, you know, whatever it may be, uh, however we may live our life with material goods. So there's nothing wrong with material goods in and of themselves, but we have to keep that in check, right? We have to temper the possession of those earthly goods and make sure that they do not become an obstacle in our pursuit of heaven. Did you know that um, one of the major issues that Jesus preaches out against you know, a lot of people think it's like sexuality and stuff, right? But actually, more even than lust or fornication or sex, I mean, one of the major issues that Jesus preaches out against is riches, right? And that is the love for the earthly goods that become an obstacle to the kingdom of heaven. I mean, Jesus literally says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not to say wealth is bad. It's not to say earthly goods are bad. But is it a source of temptation? Can it be a source of temptation? Yes. So this is why we, whatever amount of earthly goods we have, we have to always look to Jesus and ask him to help, for, help us temper this possession, right? Temper the desire for the possession, but even the goods that we have to use them for the glory of the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay. All right. So here's a summary. Uh, just by way of summary, both Jesus' temptations in the wilderness and Adam in paradise, you have temptations involving the desire for food, temptations involving the desire for goods, temptations involving the desire for self-assertion. So, <coughs> excuse me. So Jesus is the new Adam. <coughs> now, as we noted in our Lenten retreat, this is important for the season of Lent because what are the three major exercises, spiritual exercises, that Holy Mother Church encourages us to practice in the season of Lent? Almsgiving, prayer, fasting. Why? Because these three spiritual exercises remedy the threefold concupiscence or the threefold lust. So almsgiving ov obviously would remedy the lust of the eyes, which is the desire to possess earthly goods. So if I have a disorder... Uh, desire to possess goods, well then I need to give goods away to temper that disordered desire for possession, right? To balance it off. By exercising the virtue of almsgiving, I, I mitigate the vice of covetousness, you see? Praying in secret, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. By the way, Jesus talks about almsgiving in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 15, Jesus talks about praying in secret, right? Uh, and not in the street that you may be seen. Well, prayer in and of itself, just prayer, not necessarily in secret, but prayer, whether it's in privacy or liturgical prayer in public, prayer remedies the pride of life, right? Pride of life is self-assertion. I assert myself over and above God. Well, prayer, you kneel down before God and you say, I'm creature, you're creator. I'm son, you're father, right? 
So it remedies that vice of pride. And then finally, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, Jesus talks about fasting. What is fasting? Putting in check the bodily appetite, particularly for food. But if drink and sex are also involved with the bodily appetites, by putting the appetite for food in check through fasting, well then what else am I doing? I'm helping my desire for drink. I'm tempering my desire even for sex. You see? So fasting is a spiritual exercise that can actually help us in the virtue of sobriety, which has to do with food and drink. And it also helps us in the virtue of chastity. You see? Because it helps us master the flesh. To have self-mastery. Amen? Okay, now we move on finally to Jesus as the new Israel. Once again, the catechism in paragraph 538, by Jesus rebuffing these attacks, he recapitulates the temptations of Adam in paradise. We looked at that. And of Israel in the desert. So let's examine this. We look at Jesus' temptation to change the stones into bread. And note how this is a temptation involving hunger involving bread, food, right? Can you think of an event in Israel's history where they were hungry and their hunger was satisfied with food? That is the manna, right? The manna in the desert. And Jesus actually intentionally connects this temptation, change stones into bread, he connects that temptation with the event of the manna in the Old Testament. And the clue lies in Jesus' response to the devil. Jesus actually quotes from Moses' discourse in the book of Deuteronomy. When Moses is giving his final address to the Israelites before entering the promised land, before he's going to die and Joshua would lead them, Moses gives his final address to the Israelites. And in, the, in Jesus' response to the devil, in the threefold response, Jesus is going to quote from each, from different parts of that final address of Moses, right? So in, in response to the first temptation, change stones into bread, Jesus says, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, man does not live by bread alone. That's a direct quote from Moses' discourse, Moses' address to the Israelites. And that particular part of the address that Jesus is quoting, Moses is talking to the Israelites about the time when they were tested in the wilderness with hunger. So here's the context of Moses' discourse from which Jesus quotes, man does not live by bread alone. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 3. Moses says, And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. Verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, bread, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. There's the text that Jesus quotes in response to Satan's temptation, change the stones into bread. So by Jesus quoting that line, he's calling to mind the whole context of Moses' discourse, which is about the time when the Israelites were tested with hunger. Right? And so what we see here is Jesus as the new Israel actually fights the battle against the devil, a testing of hunger. And Jesus prevails where the Israelites failed, and that is trust in the Father's providence. Israel was tested with hunger, and they failed that test or that temptation because they began to murmur against Moses and God. We're hungry. You brought us out into the desert to die. We wish we were back in Egypt. We at least had some food. Can you imagine? God just set them free from their enemies, leading them through the Red Sea, two pillars of walls of water on each side, getting through the next side, looking back, and their Egyptian enemies drowned. God setting them free. And now they're hungry, and they're going to say, we wish we were back. Now, don't get 
can't get too prideful because if I was in that situation, I don't know how I would be acting either, okay? I might say the same thing and start murmuring. We don't murmur though, don't we? No. I'm ungrateful all the time for the blessings of God, right? So, I can't, I can't, I gotta give them a little slack, you know? But the point is, is that they failed in trust of the Father's providence. Here is Jesus. He's being tested with hunger and he's actually gonna succeed where Israel fails, trusting in the Father's providence. Who sent him out into the desert? The Spirit of the Father, right? The Spirit of God sent him out to fast, to abstain from food. So Jesus trusts in the Father's providence to care for him, to care even for his bodily needs. Theological insights. Note, God tested the hearts of the Israelites and the heart of his son. If God tested the heart of the Israelites, the firstborn son of God, Exodus 4.22, and God tests his true firstborn son, Jesus, well guess what? He's going to test me too. <laughs> He's going to test my heart. Now, does he need to know where my heart is? No, he already knows it, right? So, who is the test for? Me. It's for us. Whenever we're tested, it is for us to know where our heart is with God so that we can examine that, right? And put our heart where it needs to be in relation to God. Another theological insight. God, Jesus shows the true usage of kingly power. Did Jesus have the power as the messianic king and as God himself to change those stones into bread? You better believe it, man. He could have done that. I often wonder, I wonder if Satan, see, Satan can actually manipulate our senses, right? And I wonder if Satan manipulated the senses of Jesus and allowed him to smell the bread. <laughs> Interesting thought, huh? That just occurred to me, so I, 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 I don't know. But Jesus had the power to change the stones of the bread, but he did not. Why? Because if he would have, he would have been using his divine power, his kingly power for himself, as opposed to for the glory of God. Amen? And so that, how do we apply that to our life? Well, in whatever position we're in in our life, in whatever authority we have, we have to ask ourselves the question, am I using that authority for selfish reasons? Or am I using it for the service of the kingdom of God, for the glory of God? So we have to ask ourselves that question. And then another, finally, the last theological insight, Satan tempts Jesus to go against the Father's will of suffering. Right? God sent Jesus out into the desert to suffer. To fast. Yeah, so you have a physical suffering there. And Satan tempts Jesus to bypass that suffering. We also see the temptation to bypass the cross in his temptation to throw himself off the temple. Declare yourself as Messiah. Definitive act. You don't have to go to the cross to be the Messiah. Just throw yourself off. Come down a dramatic way. You'll be king and set forever, right? Or when he shows them the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all these kingdoms right now. Bow down and worship me. Well, guess what? Jesus would win those kingdoms back. But through the cross. So Satan tempts Jesus to get the kingdoms back. The kingdoms of the world. But bypass the cross. So this, all three temptations involve a temptation to bypass suffering. At the expense of bypassing the will of the Father at the expense or at the cost of denying or at the cost of disobedience to God's will. You get my point? How might this apply in our life? Can you think of events or circumstances in our modern experience of lives where we might be tempted to bypass suffering at the cost of disobeying the Father's will? How about euthanasia, folks? Assisted suicide, as it's commonly termed. It's called killing, folks. Okay? It's called murder. Very often we have this so-called option, but very often a pressure, right, being given for one to bypass the suffering at the cost of going contrary to God's plan for life and the plan for love. Um, how about in regard to the bodily appetite, right? In regard to sexual intimacy, right? And conjugal love within marriages. How many couples bypass the suffering of abstinence from sexual intercourse at the cost of disobeying the Father's will of using artificial contraceptions, you see? Because there's no suffering involved there. You see what I'm saying? 
And so this goes, it runs all the way through our life experience. We see in all of different areas of our lives where Satan tempts us to bypass suffering at the cost of disobeying God's plan for life and love and happiness. And so this is something we need to take to prayer and do our best with the grace of God to say no to Satan, right? Endure the suffering when necessary for the glory of God's kingdom. Amen? Something to think about. How about the temptation to test God? In Matthew chapter 4 verse 6, recall Satan brings him up on the pinnacle of the temple, says, throw yourself off, right? Lest you dash your foot against the stone. And then how does Jesus respond? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So this temptation, obviously, according to Jesus' response, involves some sort of testing of God, right? Well, what is this parallel in the history of Israel? It parallels that event when the Israelites murmured against God and Moses because they were thirsty. And then what does Moses do? He strikes the rock from which water flows, right? Well, that event was at Meribah. It's called Meribah or Massa or Massah. And according to Moses' discourse, that place was a place of testing God. The Israelites tested God. Now, Jesus makes an intentional parallel or connection to that event because in response to this temptation to test God, put God to the test, Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, which is a quote from Moses' discourse in Deuteronomy chapter 6, particularly verse 16. And Moses says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, okay, he's talking to the Israelites, as you tested him at Massa. Okay? Now, what is Moses talking about here? He's reminding the Israelites of that time in Massa where they put God to the test. We can read about this event in Exodus chapter 17. Here's what we find. Therefore the people found fault with Moses and says, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you find fault with me? Why do you, why do you put the Lord to the test. English translation says proof here, but it means test. Verse 3, but the people thirsted before there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? And the Lord said to Moses, you shall strike the rock, water shall come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, which means place of testing. Because of the fault finding of the children of Israel, because they put the Lord to the test by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So the Israelites say, is God among us? Prove it. We're thirsty. Give us some water. Prove yourself, God. Right? So they're putting God to the test. And Moses' discourse, he's reminding the Israelites about that event when they tested God. When Jesus responds to Satan's temptation to test God, Jesus quotes that part of Moses' discourse about Meribah and Massa testing God. So Jesus makes an intentional connection with that event. Why? Because Jesus is the new Israel. He's fighting the battle of his people and has victory where Israel failed. And that is belief in God's promises. Right? The Israelites had to put God to the test because they did not believe that God had the power to sustain them and care for them in the wilderness. So they needed proof. They needed a sign for that because they doubted God. They didn't trust in God's promises. But Jesus, he doesn't have to put God to the test because he doesn't doubt God's power, his Father's power. He doesn't doubt the Father's promises to care for His only begotten Son. And so how does this apply to our own life? Do we put God to the test? Are we saying to God, are you among us or not? Prove yourself, right? By telling God to prove Himself implies I doubt His existence. I doubt His power. I doubt His loving, fatherly care. And so... Jesus succeeds where Israel failed, and that is trust in the Father once again. And then finally, you have the temptation to idolatry in Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. Satan bribes Jesus with all the kingdoms of the world at the expense of bowing down and worshiping him, right? 
Well, what event in Israel's history might this parallel? Can you think of a time when Israel was tested with idolatry in the wilderness? And that is the golden calf incident, right? And Jesus actually makes an intentional connection to that event by once again quoting Moses' discourse when Jesus Christ says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. That's a quote from Moses' discourse, which in context he says, You shall not go after other gods. When Moses says those words in his discourse, he's reminding the Israelites about the time when they worshiped the golden calf, the holy cow. Did you get that? <laughs> okay, all right. Caught that one, huh? Whew, fly ball. Okay. Oh, what? Fly ball. We caught it. <laughs> so, by Jesus, by Jesus quoting those words of Moses, he's making a direct connection between this temptation Satan's proposing to him and the temptation Satan proposed to the Israelites in the wilderness. So the significance there is that Jesus once again fights the battle of his people and succeeds where Israel failed, and that is worship of the one true God. So a few theological insights to wrap it up. Number one, the Israelites lost trust in God when he seemed absent. What do I mean? Well, if Jesus is referring to the time when the Israelites worshipped the golden cow, if you read that narrative in Exodus chapter 32, why did they turn to a golden cow? Because Moses went up the mountain and was up for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Israelites started saying, we don't know where Moses is at. We don't know if he's even going to come down. He must be gone. He must be dead. He's no longer with us. God is no longer with us. God is absent. So what do they do? They turn to a false god. And they erect the golden cow. So, the Israelites lost their trust in God when he seemed absent. And looked to something else for their happiness. Does God seem absent in our lives at times? Oh, yes, you better believe it. Because we don't have the spiritual consolation of God's presence at all times. So when God seems absent, is he ever absent? No. But sometimes we don't feel his presence, so he seems absent. Will we turn and look to something else for our happiness? Like earthly goods and material things, material pleasures, sensory pleasures? Or will we stay faithful to God and keep Him first in our lives? And keep the sacraments first in our lives? Even though we don't feel like it, going to Mass, going to confession, etc. Right? So, good life application there. And then finally, uh, notice how Satan tempts Jesus with a pseudo-messianism. Uh, Satan says, I'll give you all these kingdoms. All the riches of the earth, of the world. Well, what was the true nature of Jesus' Messiahship? He was to reign on the cross with the crown of thorns, right? He wasn't an earthly king who would reign with political authority and have this earthly kingdom. For as Jesus told Pontius Pilate in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. It has a spiritual dimension to it. So Satan tempts Jesus with a pseudo-messianism. Life application? Satan might tempt us with a pseudo-vocation of earthly power. Right? He might tempt us to grasp at earthly prestige and power at the cost of denying our spiritual vocation and calling, which is to be a faithful son or daughter, to be a faithful Catholic Christian, right? How many times Satan tempts us as Christians with earthly prestige and power if only we deny our Catholic belief, right? You think, I mean, you can just apply it to any area from being in the home and within a small community to being on the political platform, right? Of saying, I'm Catholic, but they're but Catholics. <laughs> Let us not become but Catholics, amen? <laughs> I am Catholic, period, amen? 
And what that means is that I believe everything that Jesus has revealed to us from the Father as interpreted and taught by the Holy Magisterium of Holy Mother Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dearly beloved Mother of God, we thank you for leading us here tonight safely. Please keep us safe as we go home. Pray for all of our family members and friends. Pray for all of our brothers and sisters who are members of the mystical body of Christ. That may, they may all come to know your son Jesus in a deeper way and come to love him and serve him in a deeper way. And so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.